No one tonight, none of us who will be coming up here to remember a man we loved, will speak of Roy, of his achievements, of his motivations, of his humanity, with more eloquence than he did just then, and as he will do during the evening, in his own words. I'm Jeff Cowan, the Dean of the Annenberg School, and much more important, like so many of you here tonight, a friend, collaborator, and occasionally co-conspirator of Roy's. The evening's been organized by a wonderful group of Roy's friends and colleagues. I particularly want to thank Steve Montiel, who with his wife Elise was a dear friend and a constant visitor to Roy during his illness. And I want to thank our public affairs and our facilities teams who always do a superb job of putting these events together and have arranged to this, have this event webcast for those who couldn't be with us tonight in the auditorium. Eileen and I first met Roy more than 30 years ago. He was at the time the West Coast Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, and he was intimately involved with our dear friend Millie Harmon and was serving as a surrogate father for her three daughters who remained as spiritual children throughout his life. His world of friends in Los Angeles included young reporters such as Tom Brokaw, uh, then of uh, KNBC, and Stephen Cokie Roberts. It was a vibrant, idealistic, lively community, and Roy was always at the center of its hopes and of its dreams. He was also remarkably close to all of our children. In the years to come, he was with us in times of triumph and times of tragedy. In his uh, C-SPAN interview, Roy spoke movingly of journalism as a source of justice, a theme that remained a part of his work throughout his life. Some on this program will speak of his work tonight. I remember going with him in those early years to Oakland to teach at what was then called the Michelle Clark Program to train young minority journalists. It later became the Maynard Institute where Nancy Hicks, later Nancy Hicks Maynard, was among the leaders. With Roy's help, they were doing invaluable work then as they continue to do now. And I'm proud to say that the Maynard Institute will be represented tonight by both Nancy, Nancy Maynard, who also was his journalistic colleague and friend, and Evelyn Sue. Over the years, I worked for Roy as a columnist for the Oakland Tribune, where he was a crusading editor and he worked for me, if one could ever use that phrase to describe Roy's relationship with somebody else. When we founded the Annenberg Schools Program on Sexual Orientation Issues in the News, a pioneering effort that's done so much to contribute to this school as well as to the profession and to journalism education. Eileen and I always admired and supported his work with NLGJA, which remained a central achievement and love of his life. We'll hear more about that important work tonight from Steve Pet Petro. And Roy conspired with me in our successful efforts to bring Lauren Giglione to USC as director of the School of Journalism. And Lauren, who's now dean of the Medill School at Northwestern, recruited many of our best faculty, including Michael Parks, who's now the school's director, including Larry Noble, who's a professor who's here tonight, and Laura Castaneda, who will be speaking later. He helped us to bring Steve Montiel to run the Institute for Justice and Journalism. And Roy helped us to convince uh, Jay Harris to join our ranks. They all became a part of the school of the world we're building, building together because they believed in Roy's sense of justice and his commitment to great, clear, and fair reporting. So in a very real sense, Roy was an architect of the school that we've become. But he could never have guessed years ago that he had the talents of a poet. On the C-SPAN tape, which we've all just seen, and which will be played in its entirety during the reception upstairs this evening, Roy said that he became a journalist because he couldn't write in any other form. How wrong he was. He wrote the libretto for operas, and later we'll hear from his collaborator and friend, 
Glenn Paxton, and he was a first-rate playwright, as Susan Lowenberg will explain. I was lucky enough to work with him on one play, Top Secret, and to watch in awe as he found the fun and the passion in the story of the Pentagon Papers. For his range of professional achievements, I think it's fair to call him both a crusader for justice and a Renaissance man. But he found true happiness in his friends, including so many in this room, and in the love of his remarkable life partner, Joshua Bonet. Josh. Roy's mother, Sybil, died when he was three years old. His father, David, soon after, married a motherly woman named Anne, and they had a son together named Ron. Oh, here's Ron. Oh, uh, oh he's here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ron, Roy loved Anne and Ron and was heartbroken again when David left Anne and married Lily not a very motherly woman. Lil Roy found love and support with the extended family, mainly his uncle Morris and aunt Edith. Roy was in the process of working on an autobiographical play about this period when he died. Actually, when I went to his computer to locate some documents, I saw this document of the play open two or three different times. He was editing it. I think the experience of losing two mothers and finding love and support with the extended family made Roy treasure his relatives, and he knew how to show it. Roy renewed his connection with his brother, Ron, once they were both young adults. As Ron married and had children and grandchildren, Roy's love embraced them all. He was the one to remember Mother's Day, birthdays, anniversaries, and sent special gifts and cards for each occasion, always knowing just the right gift, just the right card to find. Through Roy, I became good friends with his close family, and this relationship is going to last. I know that not every person and especially not every gay person is so well loved and received by the extended family. I have been lucky, and I know that Roy's strong relationship with his family allowed me in. On the last Thanksgiving, Roy was quite tired, but requested to talk only with the kids, taking great interest and pleasure in all of them. Roy had a four-year relationship with Millie. The relationship almost ended up in a wedding, but then ended as Roy realized his heart was searching for a male mate. However, he remained a very close friend with Millie and her three young daughters. He kept playing a father figure in their lives. He was the formal minister in a wedding, and later on, became godfather to the next generation. I am still keeping the title Saba, grandfather in Hebrew, to one of the new kids. Just before Thanksgiving, Brooke, Ben, and little Stephen came for a visit where little Stephen and Roy found strong mutual love. Roy made great impression on my family in Israel. He made my mother his ally in convincing me that he's the one. <laughs> he and my father had an ongoing competition of who is more eccentric. <laughs> Each one convinced that the other one was much more eccentric. <clears throat> Roy and my father loved to go together to the pool in my parents' village in Israel, where Roy helped my father identify well-endowed women. Roy took my little brother, 15 at the time, to a wild night of disco in Tel Aviv. My brother came home very impressed with Roy's driving. 
recently when my little brother moved to California, Roy was so excited about having my brother kids talk to him in English that he bought them a Scrabble game to expedite their learning. When we became directly involved in parenting, donating sperm to a lesbian couple, and later on go, uh, play an ongoing role with little Benjamin life, Roy was the best playmate, delighting Benjamin to no end with little games he kept up coming with. Roy had this unique ability to find what was unique and interesting about other people. And he did it with caring and joy. Taking real interest in others, especially family members, was a common thread in Roy's life. Roy and I celebrated our 24th anniversary on November 9th, 2004. We ate at a beautiful Italian restaurant which Roy selected. Before we started eating, Roy asked me to read something he had just written. I thought it was a new aria for Monticello or a new revision of the circumcision play or a whole new creative project. Well, it was the most beautiful love letter I've ever read, written for me. Telling me in depth what he loved about me. A keen reporter's eye had observed me for 24 years, maybe with some loss of objectivity, <laughs> but with perfect style, clear, a little poetic, without a wasted word. Roy expressed his love in more ways than words, and he used his words to touch many people. I feel very fortunate to have been the recipient of so many of his words of love. And I'll finish with an excerpt from his letter. I love you. You are my strength and my anchor in these trying times. I love the way you have grown through the years, not content to remain static and complacent, and complacent, ever searching, your restless mind encircling new thoughts and ideas, trying them on for size, taking some of them off the rack, and proudly showing off others You keep my life interesting, unpredictable, a little breathless, but always in a grounded way. Your programmatic and deductive approach to issues, problems, and change gives me enough security to follow, help you modify, or just lay down and accept. Good evening. I'm Nancy Maynard. We had so much in common. We were both native New Yorkers who were born about a decade and a few miles apart, and we both became journalists. He often called me Bubala, but in the, ling in the lingo of our neighborhood, but in the Maynard household, he was known as Leroy, two words, a strong fixture, fixture in our lives. The term friend alone misses our relationship. He was a colleague, a collaborator, in the most important undertakings of mine for more than 30 years. On the day I met Roy, we were both flunking a basic rule of street reporting. The year was 1967, when the urban wars were at full throttle. Roy had just come to New York to head the Washington Post's uh, New York bureau there. I was a reporter, a new reporter for the New York Post, having just been promoted from copy boy. On this particular day, a school strike began in Brooklyn, one that pitted parents against uh, some school officials and the teachers union. The scene was charged as, pro as protesting parents lobbed raw eggs 
at the teachers. Police moved in to quash the demonstration. The parents moved in to the police. And unfortunately, Roy and I found ourselves standing between the two crowds, rushing toward us. Needless to say, we got egg on our face for more than one reason that day. We should have known better. Over the next year or so, we continued to find ourselves covering stories together. Eventually, I went off to the national staff of the New York Times, and Roy was assigned to Los Angeles uh, for the uh, Washington Post. We reconnected again about five years later when Bob Maynard, my late husband, asked his post colleague, Roy, to join him in teaching at the summer program at Columbia University. Roy took the 11-week assignment, which prepared journalists of color for reporting jobs in the daily newspaper industry, and then placed them all in newspaper jobs. We spent the summer administering tough love, some would call it terrorizing, um, our charges, most of whom went on to become very successful reporters, editors, and educators. The program, however, lost favor with the administrators of Columbia University, and they killed it. The faculty, all working journalists, felt the idea was too valuable to die so young. After all, fewer than 2% of professional journalists were members of historical minority groups at the time. And a federal report chided the press for being shockingly backward in hiring people of color. The industry said it couldn't find anybody qualified. Well, a committee working of Roy and Bob, Earl Caldwell, Frank Sotomayor, and a few others, decided to make a lie of that claim. They took it upon themselves to find the money and the location to revive the summer program, which has now become the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. <coughs> Roy was a founder, a leader at each step of the way in the 29 years. He was one of the most faithful directors. By 1997, the Institute had taken over our lives. Most of us quit our jobs. We set up operations in the Maynard household and began strategizing on building a professional journalism workforce that mirrored the American population. For much of two years, Roy and I worked side by side in uh, our new headquarters in Washington. Roy ran the job placement service while I directed Institute operations. That's when I really began to appreciate the beautiful depth of this man. He was caring and put other needs before his own. His colleagues knew it, his students knew it, and I learned it as well. I was never a smoker. And the first year that we were in the office together, Roy liked to smoke chipperillos, smelly little cigars. We struggled for a way to accommodate both of our comforts, but didn't quite work it out. So finally, I decided for self-preservation that I would try to begin to smoke, unsuccessfully, I might add, hoping that the cigar odor in my head would make the cigars go away. Roy was mortified. He refused to think that he had any role in doing something that would be harmful to one of his friends. And he apologized, and he quit cold turkey, just like that. The next year, 1979, we proved to be a very important one for both of us. One day, Roy came into the office after a trip back from Israel. And I was able to tell him of the impending birth of our third child, Alex Caldwell Maynard, who is now 25. Roy was elated, as he always was. Then he confided in me that he had fallen in love with a man in Israel and was returning to bring him home as soon as Josh could immigrate. When they came home, Roy was transformed. There was a calm in his life I had not seen before. The most obvious manifestation was his car. Roy had a 1964 Chevy Impala that he drove across the country from Los Angeles. Like many Californians at the time, Roy's back seat looked like his laundry hamper. When Josh arrived, the clutter disappeared, but so did the Chevy. A Southern California car could not survive an Eastern winter. Besides, now he had a real home. Later that year, Bob became editor of the Oakland Tribune, and we moved west, but Roy and I continued to work as I commuted back and forth. 
I always relied on him to find the, bud the number that's wrong in the budget or a fallacy in the plan. I always marveled at his restless curiosity and always told him that in my next life I wanted to come back with his metabolism. Our families became close friends, celebrating holidays together. We managed to do it ecumenically, and so everyone benefit, benefited from it. The Maynard uh, shared Passover with Roy and Josh, and uh, they were at our house for Christmas, and everybody shared gifts. One of Roy's special gifts to his friends was his talent for writing lyrics. For each of our 40th birthdays, Roy, uh, Roy wrote a song. His first was for Bob, sung to the tune of That's Why the Lady is a Tramp. It began like this. His tastes are simple, just reserve him the sweet. He'll take the house wine if it's Chateau Lafitte. You get the check, he gets the receipt. That's why Maynard is our man. <laughs> Similarly, he knew that my father worked in the Broadway pit and that I had been around show tunes long enough to remember lyrics all the time. So when I was overwhelmed with law school exams, I gave Roy doctrines that I had to memorize to put and had them put them to music. And he managed to come up with adapting uh, Duke Ellington's I've Got I Let a Song Get Into My Heart to um, the doctrine Raised Judicata, which, which sets out um, legal precedent. It was a challenge he took with glee, as always. Roy moved to California when Bob became publisher and owner of the Oakland Tribune. He was, uh, Roy was his first hire, and soon Roy rose to become executive editor and a member of the management team with Bob and with me. The paper was having life-threatening financial difficulties, but Roy's steady hand and hard creative work helped keep the enterprise afloat for the city and for 800 families that relied on the Tribune for a livelihood. But he didn't just struggle. Before he retired, the newsroom had won more than 100 awards for excellence, including a Pulitzer Prize for photography for the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, earthquake. Excuse me. And he put together in that time the most diverse newsroom in the country at the time. He wasn't a perfect man. He was the sloppiest newspaper reader I've ever read. Turning pages so quickly, it was impossible to reassemble the paper. We agreed we wouldn't share. But he was a great man. We were to have dinner two days before he died. We never had that last meeting. I missed it, and I miss him. He'll always be in my heart. I'm Susan Lowenberg, and uh, it, it was my privilege to have produced two of Roy's theater pieces. Very different. Um, one is the docudrama that Jeff talked about that he co-wrote with Jeff, Top Secret, The Battle for the Pentagon Papers, which we aired on National Public Radio uh, right around the time of the Gulf War. And um, that's when I first came to know Roy. Um, and the thing about him that struck me, uh, because we did another project together called Monticello, which is an opera, uh, which he did with Glenn Paxton. The, th the thing that struck me about Roy, who I adored, was that he was a wonderful, wonderful collaborator. And I think that his, his lifelong friendship with Jeff and with Glenn um, is a real testament to him as, as a wonderful collaborator. And as a producer, he was a great collaborator. He always had terrific suggestions. He was always willing to work on the piece. Um, and he had another thing that was t great for a producer. He knew how to get the work in on time. Uh, <laughs> maybe that was his, his journalistic background. Um, the thing about him, and when you think about, about, there are not too many people that I know that could write both a gripping docudrama and a, a really um, heart-wrenching and, and magnificent opera. But the, I think the thread that, that, um, that links these two very, very different pieces of work 
is that he was a journalist. He went for the story. He wanted to uncover the facts. And both of these pieces share that. Um, the story, uh, you all know the story of, of, um, of, of the Pentagon Papers. What he and Jeff focused on was the 12 hours in Ben Bradley's living room when they all had to decide whether or not to publish the papers. Um, in Monticello, he tells the story of the relationship between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. And the promise that Jefferson made to Sally Hemings that he did not fulfill, which was to free the slaves when he died that worked for him. Um, these were, the, these were the, the issues that, um, that really drove him to, to write these pieces. He wrote the pieces with Jeff and with Glenn around these issues. And that's what gave them their, their immediacy, their heart, their importance. Um, top secret is, has actually been given to 2,500 high schools all over the country, and teachers use them every day in every state of the Union to teach um, the story of national security versus the people's right to know. So top secret is something that um, is, a, is a wonderful legacy, as is, as is Monticello. Um, all of these, these, these programs are also aired on the radio. And last week, um, in honor of Roy, we did Monticello as a two-hour radio show on national public radio and satellite radio. And um, for those of you who may have missed it, and the, the, the lovely thing was that Terry Gross had interviewed Roy about 10 years ago. Uh, and we were able to get an excerpt from that interview and put it on the radio show. So if any of you would missed it and would like to hear the radio program, you can actually log on to kpcc.org and hear Monticello and hear part of his interview with Terry Gross. Um, you just click on the plays, the thing, and until through Saturday, you can actually hear the program. You can hear the opera. Um, we are going to actually, hmm? Did you have a question? Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> uh, we are now, now I would like to actually, I think the best thing that I can say to you about Roy is to, to show you some of his wonderful work. And we are going to um, now have you listen to the very end of the first act of Top Secret, The Battle for the Pentagon Papers. It is the scene when all of the reporters and Ben Bradley and... Um, the president of the Post, Washington Post Company, are trying to decide whether or not to publish the papers. Um, they finally realize that they have to go to Kay Graham, the publisher, and they get on the phone with her to talk to her about this because she is going to have to make the final decision. Um, she is at a garden party, and they interrupt the garden party. So are you all, are you guys ready to roll? Okay, so this is, this is top secret, the battle for the Pentagon Papers, Roy Ahrens and Jeffrey Cowan. Yes, I'll ask him to get on the line. Okay. Catherine. Yes. It's Ben. Hello, Ben. I'm on the other extension. All right. Look, if we fail to publish, we're coming down on the government side against the times. <laughs> it's going to look like the Washington Post is endorsing prior restraint as a legitimate weapon against the press. Uh, hello, Ms. Graham. This is Brian Sullivan. Uh, how do you do? Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, but what, what, what I've been arguing is that by immediately publishing secret documents, the reporters have hardly had time to examine. The, the Post would inadvertently reveal sensitive and damaging material. The paper could be accused of endangering lives in wartime. The government can accuse us of a lot of things. The question is, would any of it stick? Catherine, this is not about national security. It's not about espionage. It's about politics. To Nixon, we're the enemy. If they think they can get away with it, they'll use all kinds of threats to intimidate us. Mrs. Graham, uh, this is an unprecedented situation. We can't predict what the government might resort to in this case. I'm convinced it's a game of chicken. But, Ben, if Brian and Fritz are right, it could destroy the newspaper. I understand what Fritz is saying, Catherine. But there's more than one way to destroy a newspaper. All right, everybody, just hold on a second. Um, 
Brian, I'm not altogether clear why you feel our reporters aren't able to distinguish between so-called good and bad information. I, I have great respect for the Post's magnificent staff, Mrs. Graham. But unlike the New York Times, we haven't had three months to study this material, and we're staring in the face of an injunction that was handed down by the court in New York. However, I think maybe we could cure this by holding off for a single day. Yeah, a day in which we let the government know we have the paper. Is that what's being proposed? Well, Brian is suggesting we give the government a chance to tell us what sections of the papers they consider most sensitive. Ben, oh. tell her about those guys in there. Chow and Murray and George have gone through the stuff, and they agree there's nothing in it that threatens the security of the country. I'll stake my reputation on it. Ms. Graham, I'm sure Fritz Beebe can tell you better than I that there's a lot more than reputation at stake. I'll tell you this. If the Post caves on this issue, Catherine, you're going to lose some of your top reporters and maybe an editor or two. Just who are you talking about? Chow just threatened to publicly resign if we don't print tomorrow. My God, Ben, he can't be serious. I'm afraid he is. We all feel the Post has information about what really happened in Vietnam, which our government tried to suppress. If, under a threat from that government, we back off, we might as well become a shopping mall giveaway. All right, all right. Uh, I've got your arguments. Let me talk to Fritz alone. Well, Meg, the editors have made their case. What's happening? She's tossing it to Fritz. Oh. Well, you're, you're aware of the stock issue, of course, and the FCC licenses from a purely fiscal viewpoint. I have to advise you that we could be very vulnerable. Now, naturally, that has to be weighed against the journalistic consequences. What do I think? Uh, well, on balance, I, I think I wouldn't. Oh, that's the ballgame. Yeah, but ultimately, it's up to you. All right, Kay. Thanks. Goodbye. We publish. So that's top secret. Um, I'd just like to close with um, with uh, something that my colleague uh, Michael Alexander wrote, which I think really exemplifies. Um, Roy the artist. He said, the fact that he was a journalist and spent much of his life involved in providing the facts, the news, probably made him a better artist. He knew that art is a lie in the service of truth, and few artists have given us clearer pictures of the truths that are critical to our understanding of who we Americans are and of at least two of the landmark elements that shape the country that we now live in. Thanks. I'm Glenn Paxton, the composer of Monticello. In the spring of 1999, I received a package from George White, founder and president of the Eugene O'Neill Theater Foundation in New York and uh, Connecticut. In the package was a libretto in verse to an opera about Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson by Roy Ahrens, whom I did not know. George White said he had been asked to find a composer for this project, and he sent it to me. I was very moved by the powerful script, and I contacted Roy, and we agreed that I would set a small part of it to music, and that he would come down and listen to it in Ojai, where I live, and then uh, we could take it from there. Um, so one day, he and Josh arrived in Ojai, and uh, I played for Roy, and he said he liked it, and then he asked me to play it for Josh. And Josh didn't throw up or anything. <laughs> so we were in business. Three months later, as I finished the score, Susan Lohenberg picked it up and set out to produce it under the title Monticello at the Skirball for LA Theater Works. And a little while later, Michael Alexander produced a full out production at California Plaza for grand performances. My collaboration with Roy had begun, and it was a wonderful, sensitive, fulfilling relationships, uh, relationship. Collaborations are really difficult. I had one that lasted only 15 minutes. <laughs> it did, really. It had been very elaborately set up, too. But with Roy, it was easy from the first, with the necessary trust building throughout the five years we worked together. We had many further plans. As an example of Roy's sensitive writing for music, I'd like to present one aria from Monticello. 
Soprano Shauna Blake Hill, one of this country's greatest young singers, worked with Roy and me from the beginning, really another collaborator, playing Sally Hemings in both productions and performing other music of ours <laughs> in many concerts. Our other collaborator, music director and pianist Vicki Kirsch, can't be here today, so I'm going to play the piano for Shauna Blake Hill. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. In this number, Sally begins by saying goodbye to her last child, Madison Hemings, to leave home, muses on the passing years at the plantation and her relationship with Jefferson, who is now in his 80s. It is about change and loss and trying to cope with it.
had so many circles of interest, so many families, as it were, and the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education was one of his families. My name is Evelyn Sue, and I am program director at the Institute and proud to be here as a member of the extended Maynard Institute family. I was also Roy's student, or I should say Roy and Nancy's student, in 1979 in the summer program for minority journalists. Nancy recalls it as tough love. I recall it more as the first circle of hell. <laughs> this two and a half months, 14 hour days, nonstop assignments, exacting, merciless, prosecutorial editing from Roy and Nancy and the other journalists they brought to train us. And I think even then, as we kind of dragged ourselves around Berkeley that summer, we realized that what they were doing for us was for our own good. That at the end of the summer, when we went to newsrooms across the country, we would be watched and not always kindly we would face a great deal of skepticism sometimes. We would have to prove our places in the newsroom. We would have to fight for those places. So they wanted to prepare us and sometimes prepare us for the worst. One of my classmates that summer would go to a newsroom in the Deep South and be the only African American on the staff. I went to the San Francisco Chronicle where I was the only Asian American in the newsroom at that time, and only the second one in the history of the paper. So many careers were launched that summer by Roy and Nancy and Frank Sotomayor. My classmates include Kevin Merida, who is now associate editor at the Washington Post, Larry Bivens, who's based in Washington as a correspondent for the Gannett News Service, Gwen Young, an editor at Newsday, Larry Hicks, an editor at the Sacramento Bee, Louis Sahagan, a reporter at the Los Angeles Times, Mia Navarro, correspondent for the New York Times. 
As a student of Roy's and later a friend and colleague, I was really privileged to measure the progress of my career against my interactions with, with Roy. He was the frightening and intimidating teacher at first. Later, he was a coach and a counselor, the person I would call and say, Roy, I really don't think I can do this when I had a hard day or was facing a particularly challenging project. Later, as fellow veterans of the Washington Post, we could commiserate and share war stories. And we were colleagues on the Maynard Institute board where I learned from him and others how to think the audacious thoughts to see how you could create change through the force of ideas, the rightness of your argument. And there were also times when I would lean back and I would observe Roy and think, gee, Roy has a really big ego, but I think he deserves it. <laughs> There was that wonderful day where he told me that he wanted to, he wished he could hire me. And finally, there was the day when our roles reversed. And we were standing uh, on the pier at Jack London Square in Oakland. And we were both involved in journalism training by then. I was working at the American Press Institute and the Pointer Institute. And Roy was uh, starting up a program and describing it to me. And then he said, what do you think? What would you do? And I, was, uh, so I started kind of babbling my answer. I thought, this is a high point in my life because Roy Ahrens is asking for my advice. I think at the Institute, we feel his presence, I think, even more strongly in his absence. We feel his energy, and we are determined never to falter in the mission. Thank you. We did a very comprehensive survey covering such areas as coverage and work, workplace conditions. And we indeed managed to get 205 responses and produced a rather comprehensive 80-page booklet, which we presented uh, to the national conference, the annual conference of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, which is a high-powered organization which gets a tremendous amount of coverage, and it was in Washington, and I was asked to make the presentation. And I had just gone through this experience of having spoken to several hundred gay journalists, most of whom were kind of hovering in the shadows in their newspapers, and I had asked myself the question, do I present myself as a peer editor and let it go at that, or do I make, do I go national? You know, do I say I'm gay also? And I, I struggled with that uh, for a lot of reasons, right up to the, mo the, uh, the morning of the presentation. I woke up and said, I cannot do that. I can't allow my colleagues to be hiding and f and and to, and to document that without taking the step. So I penciled in at the end of my address, something to the effect of, as, a, as an editor and a gay man, I'm proud of the ASNE for doing this study. And so I, I presented it and uh, uh, went through the, the entire presentation and at the end said that. And I, I, I'll never forget that as I spoke those words, there was a subtext that involuntarily spoke inside me. It was a very interesting uh, it's something, some of the effect, uh, here I am, world, all of me at last. It was like a sigh of, of uh, relief that it's finally the hiding was thoroughly over. Here I am, world, all of me at last. I just heard that for the first time a couple of hours ago. It makes me so proud of Roy, and I think. For each of us, that could be the epitaph that, that we wish for in life. I'm Stephen Petra. I'm the immediate past president of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association. I want to thank Dean Cowan and Steve Montiel for hosting us today. And I want to also acknowledge my colleagues, Pamela Struther 
NLGJ's Executive Director, Martha E. Flores, who's on our national board, and Steve Pride, who is our Los Angeles chapter president, for being with us today. You can tell from the program that we were all given um, homework assignments. You know, we have our little, Susan talked about the artist, and uh, Nancy talked about the journalist, and I was given the assignment of talking about the founder, so I will, I will do my homework properly. <laughs> Sixteen years ago, I was one of the um, journalists who were hovering in the shadows that, that Roy just spoke about. I was a closeted journalist, and then I met Roy Ahrens. This was in 1989, when newspaper reporters were commonly uh, referred to in whispers as fags and dykes. That was the, the common moniker for lesbian and gay journalists in newsrooms. And many reporters feared coming out for losing their jobs. It was truly another error. When we first met, Roy was conducting the landmark study for the American Society of Newspaper Editors that put sexual orient orientation directly in the crossfires of public debate. And that first evening, Roy, who was then executive editor of the Oakland Tribune, he spoke to a small group of lesbian and gay reporters. We were up in the hills above San Francisco. And he talked about his coming out at age 55 and about that survey. And as a young reporter, I, like so many others then and later, was awakened by his message, especially when he told us his aims for lesbian and gay journalists, to strengthen our identity, to strengthen our respect, and to strengthen our status in the newsroom and throughout the practice of journalism. But Roy's vision was even bolder. Later that same evening and for years to come, he spoke of the importance of fostering fair and accurate coverage of lesbians and gays, which over time came to include bisexual and transgender individuals, which over time came to become the mission of NLGJA. But Roy didn't mean special coverage he meant equal coverage. He meant unbiased coverage. And within the year, Roy's study, now known as the groundbreaking report, Alternatives, Gays and Lesbians in the Newsroom, was released. And with it, the silver-haired editor came out publicly. And I can't emphasize to you how much courage that took in 1989. It was truly a different time. Six months later, Roy founded NLGJA, which, as many of you know, is a professional organization of journalists and journalism educators that has now grown to more than 1,300 members with 24 chapters. And I like to tell the story um, when, I had, when I was president that uh, the, only, uh, the only negative that came from this was the acronym NLGJA, which is never really easy to uh, sort of roll off, roll off your mouth. And, um, I think it was Roy who, um, who said that we should really pronounce it negligee. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and in 2000, in the year 2000, negligee celebrated its 10th anniversary up in San Francisco. And as I sat in the ballroom that night, I listened to Roy speak again, and I thought back to that first time in 1989. Then there had been a handful of us. And now he spoke proudly to hundreds of LGBT journalists in that ballroom. And through our work and your work, we speak and write to millions of people every day, fostering fair and accurate coverage. That night in 2000, Roy told us, today we celebrate ourselves for all that has been achieved. Tomorrow there is still work to be done. So in closing, let me take Roy's words and direct them towards him. Tonight we celebrate and honor all that Roy achieved, and that is mighty. And tomorrow, yes, tomorrow there is still work to be done. To, to continue Roy's legacy, NLGJ has established the Leroy F. Ahrens Journalism Education Program, which brings all of our educational projects under one umbrella. We hope that you will join us in that effort and in doing that, remembering Roy. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Laura Castaneda. I'm an assistant professor of journalism here at USC. Roy Ahrens never considered himself to be much of a teacher, but the work he spearheaded with such enthusiasm, grace, and good humor will have a permanent impact on educators, students, and the journalism profession. 
Roy was instrumental in persuading the Accrediting Council of Journalism Schools to add sexual orientation to its revised diversity standards. This means that journalism schools seeking accreditation or reaccreditation must now develop a curriculum that fosters an understanding of issues and perspectives that is inclusive in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Journalism schools must prove that they are meeting this diversity standard in a variety of ways, including the development of syllabi and course materials. As usual, Roy was way ahead of the game in this respect. A course he launched here at Annenberg titled The American Press and Issues of Sexual Diversity was among the first of its kind and has become a model for similar classes at universities across the country. Roy also established and served as director of Annenberg's Sexual Orientation in the News Program. The program's website provides information about curriculum issues, research, and workshops. Best of all, for journalism educators and students, links to news articles from around the country and around the world that focus on sexual orientation issues also are available. Roy had a direct impact on students, too. Professor Shannon Campbell was teaching public relations at the University of Kansas, located in what she calls the Bible Belt's buckle teaching a media and diversity course in the Bob Dole Auditorium in the Bob Dole Building. When two gay men and one bisexual woman in her media and diversity course asked whether there was a place for them at the school. She began searching for such a place and found that all roads led to one person, Roy. Thanks in large part to Roy, by December 2002, the University of Kansas fully sanctioned the establishment of a student chapter of the NLGJA or Negligé. After Roy became ill, he tried and usually succeeded in never letting his health issues slow, slow him down. Annenberg doctoral student Carlos Godoy was hired by Roy to be the website editor for the sexual orientation in the news site three years ago. He says that the first few weeks after starting his job, Roy would call him like clockwork at 7 a.m., bubbling with the latest news about a public issue concerning the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. At one point during Roy's cancer treatment, Carlos flew to Northern California to discuss the creation of an interactive course DVD for journalism educators. At last summer's National Convention for Journalism Educators in Toronto, Roy and Dr. Lillian Dunlap, a media scholar and consultant, organized a pre-convention workshop that focused on how journalism educators could tackle issues of sexual orientation in their classrooms. Through most of the preparation time, Roy was undergoing chemotherapy. But each time they spoke, Dr. Dunlap reports that all he could talk about was how they could offer professors the tools they need to do a better job of teaching inclusive, truthful, and excellent journalism. I got to know Roy when I agreed to co-teach the American Press and Issues of Sexual Diversity course that he created. Eventually, Roy proposed that we co-edit a book titled The Fractured Mirror, Readings About Sexual Difference in the Media, that would introduce issues of sexual difference to journalism students and provide them with resources and course exercises. He had to bow out of the project when his treatments became too grueling, but Professor Campbell, who has since moved to Annenberg, agreed to help me finish the project. Just a week before he died, Roy called me at home, also at 7 a.m. in the morning, to offer to write the introduction to the book and help us track down photos. Roy was an elegant and kind man whose love for his work and devotion to his mission never waned. He is sorely missed. However, the work he began to bring greater visibility to gay and lesbian journalists and improve the coverage of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender issues in the media lives on. Professor Campbell and I hope that The Fractured Mirror, which will be released this summer and is dedicated to Roy, makes a positive contribution to these efforts and will help carry on his legacy. Thank you. Thank you all for a beautiful ceremony. The, all the participants, the organizers, the, uh, the staff that put this together so beautifully um, did a magnificent job. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful tribute to, to Roy's amazing life. But those of us at the Annenberg School didn't want to leave this with a tribute to a great life. We didn't want to say goodbye. We wanted, as Roy would have wanted, to create a new beginning. And so a group of the conspirators who had done such a good job of putting this event together met the other day to discover what it was that we could do that would memorialize and continue and start anew the work that he's done. And so I'm proud to announce that today we have established the Roy Aarons Summer Institute 
on sexual orientation issues in the news. This institute should become the premier place to train journalism educators and others who want to train students about sexual orientation issues. We think it will be a wonderful tribute, and as the founding directors of that institute, we have two of the other people that Roy helped to bring to this school and have done so much for it. The director of the School of Communication, Larry Gross, and a professor who had left us for far too long and is now back at the Annenberg School and is a great leader in the diversity field, as, uh, as Larry has been in the field of sexual orientation issues, Felix Gutierrez. So Felix and Larry will be the directors of this institute. It will start this summer, and we think that it will have a great effect on generations to come. As the ceremony ends, we'll be playing music from the soundtrack of Prayers for Bobby. And as you leave, we'll be handing out at the door a news release announcing the Roy Aaron Summer Institute. And we invite you all to join us for one last celebration here for Roy up in the lobby where we will continue to play the full C-SPAN interview, which you've seen parts of tonight. Thank you all so much for being part of this marvelous event.